Welcome back to Forbidden Knowledge News. I'm your host, Chris Matthew. Tonight, I want to welcome back to the show, Corey Hughes. He is a former police officer who now investigates everything from 9-11 and the JFK assassination to government psychological warfare and mind control campaigns. Corey, welcome back. How are you doing tonight? Good. Thank you for having me again so soon. And thank you for coming back on. You always have fascinating information to share. And tonight, I know, won't be any different. Um, tonight, we're going to be discussing police and law enforcement corruption. Uh, I believe it's occurring on a national scale. But that being said, I know there are many good police officers out there who are genuinely trying to help people and make a difference. Uh, but the system is just corrupt from the top down. And there are too many willing participants in this corruption. And most people have no idea or just turn a blind eye to what's really going on out there and how corrupt uh, some of these law enforcement organizations can be. And you used to be a police officer. So let's start with uh, some of your experiences. Um, tell us a little bit about your experience uh, being a police officer. Uh, you know, tell us how it started and then when did you start to realize the corruption? And as far as police work goes, is very, it's, it's a unique type of corruption. I mean, you have the type of corruption in some places where you have administration involved with like, you know, drug trafficking or organized crime, but the standardized street level corruption, the average police officer doesn't acknowledge or see as corruption. And that really encompasses things like, uh, you know, planting evidence, arresting people for nothing, the using of violence as, as, a, as a tool. Um, so when you go out on the road, and you interact with the public, it's a, a lot of what you do is very ego driven. Um, I was a cop for about nine years. From the time that you enter till the time that you leave, you become a different person. Uh, you go in a cow and you come, back, you come out a hamburger is pretty much how it is. I went in thinking, oh, I'm gonna be the cool cop who you know, doesn't bust anybody for weed and lets everyone go and you know, that was kind of my attitude, but right. you have like a year, almost a year long application process where they do multiple background checks. They go interview your neighbors. And so you have this like waiting period, this anticipation period that um, you start a, a voluntary indoctrination that you probably don't even realize you're doing, but you start to kind of, um, you start to kind of become more. I don't know, you, you want the job so bad, you're willing to do anything to get it. And the longer that waiting period goes on, the more your mind is like, oh, I want it, I want it, I want it. And then once you get it, that's like the end of the first phase of becoming uh, corrupt in as far as how police are corrupt. And so then you go through like a police academy and throughout the course of the police academy, it's very, it's, it's quasi military run. You know, you have to be there right on time, clean shaven every day. You, you know, you, you start off the day most of the time with running and push ups and physical activity, and then you get into classroom stuff. But there's really a process over time. And when you enter, um, you're, you're a normal person. And by the time you hit the road, you are so gung ho about being a cop and being a part of the culture that, you know, you go home from work and you, you leave the radio on to listen to what calls are coming in. You know, everything in your life becomes very police oriented and you don't realize the shifts that are happening in your personality. I mean, when I was growing up, I was punk rock since the time I was like 12 years old. You know, uh, I got in trouble with my mom because I was writing to Gigi Allen. Any punk rockers out there know who Gigi <laughs> Allen is? I was writing to yeah. Gigi Allen when he was in prison, and I have a stack of letters and autographs from him from prison. And when my mom found out, she freaked out, right? So that's who I was my whole life. Um, I, I was a drug dealer. I sold weed for years. I had my house raided by the cops, right? Like, and so... This I sounds not, similar to my childhood as well. <laughs> <laughs> I was not on the law enforcement side at all. And so really what prompted me to become a cop was, you know, I, it's a long story. I'll make it very short. I was work, working with a guy. We opened our own company and he paid for it. I ran it. It was a record store. We were doing good. 
after a year, he was convinced by his advisors that he could run the store without me. And so even though I built the whole thing, he just basically fired me and we had been friends for like 10 years. And so it was really like, it was very hurtful, but it really made me realize that there's nothing solid out. There's nothing stable out there that you can depend on like that. So I was like, you know, screw it. Let me get a job working for the city. I'll get a pension. You know, I'll get all the standard stuff. And um, that's what kind of led me to police work because being a fireman just seemed boring. And I thought it would be cool. I'd get to have some excitement. And um, that was what prompted me to get into it in the first place, even though it was like totally contrary to everything I had been before that, right? So you start this process before you even apply, right? You start to change in mindset before you apply. And over the years, the goal really shifts um, and it becomes more of a, once you're in and you know the job, you really start to want to climb the ladder, right? You want to be a sergeant because they make way more money. And then you're like, the lieutenants don't do shit. They sit in an office all day. That sounds like a cush job, right? So you start to do things to impress your uh, supervisors or to be noticed. You want good stuff on your annual, you know, they do an annual report on you. And so that's kind of where it starts. But it goes from be, just, you know, trying to be a good cop to everyone, almost everyone takes it too far. And the ego really is what drives you. And when you get out on a call, a simple call, it doesn't even matter what it is. It doesn't even have to be a crime. You just be talking to somebody. And if they're not recognizing your authority, if you can't flex your authority and maintain control of the situation, then that pisses you off. And then what tool do you have? You have the tool of arrest. And so therefore, people start making bad arrests just because you pissed them off or said something they didn't like. And I'm just, I was just as guilty of all of that. Uh, so the indoctrination really is, it's a self indoctrination. And once you're actually on the road, like good luck maintaining your old friendships, um, good luck um, having solid family relationships. Um, it really is an overall, it's an extremely dis uh, destructive career to be in for the, for the self, right? You end up uh, really becoming a person you don't like. And uh, it took me about four or five years to really, re to, I, I felt like something was wrong. You know, I was like, I wasn't getting any promotions. I wasn't getting special details. I wasn't getting things that I needed in order for me to move up the ladder. But I, my agency was only 150 guys, you know, only had like uh, five or six detectives and I wanted more. So I, went, I ended up after, it took me a couple of years to get in with the county agency, but at around seven years, I moved to a different agency. They were big, they had 3,000, you know, 1,000 at the jail, 2,000 on the road. And um, it was uh, that, when, once I got to that agency, it, that was very eye-opening because the, that agency, um, the level of uh, like the good old boy system and like, you know, there was a lot of golden children, meaning like, guys who basically they know that their careers is, is uh, set because they're in with the right people, the right, right supervisors, you know, that was obvious there. I was like, Oh my God, this is crazy. Um, and when I left police work, it wasn't at the time because I was aware of any corruption or anything like that. What really got me was my, my girlfriend at the time was a really bad alcoholic and I had had to call the police on her. Like, five or six times within the first six months of being at my new agency, right? And that's bad right away. They should have fired me right away just for having to have, just for calling the cops that many times. Like they, they don't tolerate that kind of stuff, but I was really good at my job and I had really great numbers. I made a lot of arrests. And so they were kind of like really patient with me. Um, but eventually they, tried, they started to jam me up. They, and they had nothing to jam me up on, but they continued to try because um, they didn't like the fact that they told me basically get rid of my girlfriend and everything's going to be cool. And wow. that's when it really hit me that they're trying to control, you know, they have so much control over the officer's life. And I was like, you know, I'm just not down with that. And I had been really kind of miserable at the profession. Not that I didn't like the job every day, but it was taking such an emotional and physical toll on, on my body that like, I just, I, 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 I knew something was wrong. Didn't really know what, and then towards the end, when all this stuff with my girl happened, that is really when I um, had my eyes opened. And uh, the single most important thing I did was I read a book. And I'm gonna, this is, if anybody wants to understand police, like really understand why they're out there kicking everyone's ass and why they're out there murdering 1,500 people a year in this country, um, you have to pick up a book. It's called Emotional Survival for Law Enforcement, 
a guide for officers and their families. And it's by a guy named Dr. Kevin Gilmartin. And I credit this book 100% um, for giving me the, um, for giving me what I needed to actually leave. Because once you're in, you don't want to get out. It's like you're part of the cool club. And if you get out, you know, it's like you're not one of the cool kids anymore. To sum it up on like a, you know, elementary kind of level. But um, after a while, basically when you're a cop, you go down the road, I'll explain it to you. There's, there's a thing called hypervigilance. And hypervigilance, you experience at uh, times when you're, you know, like the example I gave you earlier. And if you go to your house and your front door's obviously kicked open, you will instantly enter a state of hypervigilance where you, it's not fear, it's not nerves, it's, it's a heightened state. You can tell it right away. You kind of get an adrenaline rush and um, cops live in that state almost all the time. And it's, it's, it's like a drug. When you get on, when, as soon as you put your uniform on and you get in your car and you drive to work, you enter into this state of hypervigilance. It's very low level, not like you know someone's uh, you see something in, you know going on, or not like someone broke in your house. But it's just a natural state that you persist in because you always need to be on heightened awareness as a cop. You know, is someone walking up behind me? What's going on over there? You just it, you persist in this state as though there are threats surrounding you. And the overall effect of entering into hypervigilance every single day um, destroys your body. Um, basically, when you go to work and you put your uniform on, you enter the state, you get off of work, you come home, and you're in that state of hypervigilance for usually around 10 to 12 hours. And it takes between 16 and 24 hours for your body to recuperate from a state of hypervigilance. But within that 24 hour period, you're going back to work the next day. So your body never physically recovers. Your mind never recovers. Emotionally, you never recover, but you don't realize that these things are happening. And you know, you do more than a couple of years on the road and your life starts to, I don't know how to explain it because it's different for every officer, but um, things in your life start to change in the negative, right? Uh, if you look at all these police shootings that are going on uh, and look at the statistics, I mean, we put 50,000 American citizens in the hospital every year, police do. Uh, they murder between, this year they say the statistics are under 1,000. They're lying. They're probably the same as ever, uh, uh, probably in the 12 to 1,300 range at the minimum, uh, 1,500 on average. Um, the, reason that we, the reason that cops in America at least are doing this uh, and they probably don't even realize it, is that they are being affected by these cycles of hypervigilance. And when you have these cycles of hypervigilance and you tie it to uh, an inflated ego because you have some power over people, that is, what, that is the formula that creates monsters. Um, real quick, I, I talk about a lot of this stuff on my show. It's the only show I actually do right now. It's called Debunking Cops. And um, I talk about the, the nitty gritty of police work and these type of topics. Um, and uh, honestly, I think it's pretty freaking boring, you know, but it's, but the thing I, things I talk about, things are things that people need to understand if they want to understand why police are um, acting in the manner that they do. So, and you brought up a good point about, you know, if as a police officer, if you screw up or you make a bad decision or you actually, you, you kill somebody, do something that you know you weren't supposed to do, you're most likely going to be uh, supported by your peers. It could be, you know, to the point of where everything gets uh, covered up in some way, right? Ah, that's a great question. The, here's the reality of it. Um, when you see on the news that cops always have each other's back and they're always defending people who obviously should not be defended, that's just on TV. In the real world, cops throw each other under the bus every single day. They almost go out of their way to screw people that they work with. Um, and that is, uh, that's the reality of it. Like, I've seen cops do things that weren't really that big a deal and get fired over it. Um, and I've seen cops who I know for a fact murdered people um, who, you know, and when it hit the news, they covered it up. And... It's really, uh, for someone who's been in it and has seen it, it's really disheartening. Uh, just about a year ago, maybe 18 months tops, the first agency I worked for had their first uh, officer-involved shooting in like 10 years or something. 
I don't even think there, oh, there was one when I was there. I was there for seven years and it was only one, right? Uh, I was fortunate enough that my agency was actually, they're pretty on point. And if you screw up, you're going to get fired. But as soon as something hits the news, that is when they go into um, uh, defensive mode. Uh, and that is when the uh, unions come out and start to just, you know, defend whatever happens. Uh, look at this Geiger case, the Amber Geiger case that just happened. That dumb bitch went into the wrong apartment on the wrong floor and shot a black guy in his right. apartment. And the unions were all backing her. And that's all just PR. Um, but the reality is, like, cops, uh, you have kind of like a... Um, there's kind of three lists in law enforcement. You got, you got the golden children, right? Those are the ones who at the top, who, no matter what they do, they're going to be protected. You got guys in the middle who eh, can go either way, you know, depends on what they do. And then you got guys at the bottom who basically they will do everything they can to screw you. And um, I've seen it over and over and over. I, I knew a guy who was a really good cop, great with talking to people on the road, did not ever have any uses of force because he was good at de-escalating situations. They ended up firing him, and the excuse they used was he didn't write good reports. Well, guess what? They could have sent him to report writing school. They never did. They just fired him because they didn't want him. Um, that's kind of how police uh, business works. And it is a business. It's about money extraction, 90%, because the vast majority of the time, you're just sitting in your car. Uh, you're doing traffic. You know, you're doing things that are not criminal-related. Um, you end up doing a lot of civil stuff because they send you out to, you know, disputes over, um, you know, um, alimony and, and the child support and stuff like that. I've had to arrest people for not paying child support. It's like, that's not even criminal. It's civil in nature. So you end up doing a lot of things that are not, um, you know, law enforcement seemingly related. Um, traffic enforcement is the biggest scam there is. Uh, but I was going to uh, ask you about, about that, about, uh, you know, speeding tickets to, to meet a quota. Uh, uh, here's how here's how quotas work. Okay, well, by law, you're not allowed to have a quota. However, if you're the guy who has the least amount of tickets that month, how do you think that looks to the supervisors? Right, right. It's not good if you tell them they actually the chief came in one day and said, "Hey, you know, we we really want some uh, more activity out there. So if you guys could please just get like you know ten or fifteen just warnings you don't have to write tickets you can just write warnings just write just do 10 or 15 a month you know that's like one every other day not a big deal and uh, most people really just did it didn't have a problem you'd normally get 10 or 15 in a month anyway really if you're out there just doing your job um but the thing is if you don't do that you're not getting promoted you are not moving up the ladder you're not getting that requested day off you know if you don't fall in line they have ways of taking care of people like you you know so that's kind of how quotas work. There really are no quotas, but they make it clear if you don't do what they say, you know, and fulfill X amount of tickets, you know, you'll, you'll hear about it, you know? Uh, so that's, that's kind of how it is. There, there are, there are unofficial quotas. Now, earlier you had mentioned how the um, amount of police uh, people murdered or killed by the police is probably highly underreported and I can imagine as well as the number of pr police brutality cases that are just not reported um, I, you know how high do you think these numbers uh, actually go um, from what I can tell on average um, if you took into consideration the underreportedness of the uh, of the statistic um, I would say there's probably around 1500 uh, Americans killed by police every year. That's one every seven hours. That's three a day. That's unheard of. Uh, the UK last year had three total for the whole year. Um, so it's, it's definitely a unique problem to America. I mean, however, the violence is, and you're starting to see with these Hong Kong protests and all these countries have like riot police and those guys are gung ho and, um, they're out there messing people up, but um, 1,500 people, three a day, that's, un that's unacceptable. And if you look at statistics, the number of unarmed people who are not posing a threat is somewhere between 20 and 40%. And so the shootings themselves, um, I don't know, it's almost like a notch in your belt to, to a lot of cops, right? They'll do it they'll, and they'll shoot somebody because... It's just another experience of the job to have, even though the vast majority of cops will never, ever uh, shoot somebody. 
Um, in particular, I'm going to tell a real quick story. I was, uh, I've been out, out of work sick for like two weeks. I was, I was really sick. And the day I was supposed to get back, um, I overslept, I worked a midnight shift. And my sergeant calls me like right as my shift was supposed to start. And he put me on speakerphone in front of the whole read-off room. It was kind of funny at the time. But um, the very first call that went out that night was my zone. It would have been my call. And um, since I was late, somebody else took it. And it was, there was an officer involved shooting and they knew exactly what was going on. It was a suicide by cop. Guy went into a, like a Walgreens drugstore, put, you know, put his arm in his jacket like he had a gun and said, give me the money. And then when they gave him the money, he gave them his address and said, tell the cops that's where I'm at. And so obviously there's something up here, right? And they should have right. known, they should have known no gun was ever seen. He was obviously needing some kind of help. So they get out to his house and he, the guy ends up running out of his house and he had nothing in his hands or he had a wallet in his hands or it was something that could never have been mistaken for a gun. And just for running out of the house like that, um, three officers shot him dead. When I read the notes um, the next day, they were pretty long, but I read them in depth. I was blown away because it was brutally obvious it was a suicide by cop. The wife had called in and said, he does not have a weapon. Don't shoot him. He needs help. Uh, does he does not have a weapon, but they shot him anyway. And nope. the excuse they'll use is that he was a potential threat, but he wasn't. And they knew it based on the information that had been provided to them. But instead of sending out, you know, like uh, any kind of, of uh, psychological or hostage negotiation team or anybody who's trained in, you know, kind of de-escalation, they didn't. They just sent out three dumb road cops who went out and shot him and they knew they were going to shoot him if he came out of the house. So. Um, it was really, I felt really lucky that I was not at work that night because I didn't want any, I didn't want to have any part of it. That was an eye-opening experience for me, for sure. We, we see so many cases like this. Uh, we hear about it all over the, the country. Uh, basically, the same thing happening. The police know the person isn't a threat or it would seem, it would, it's obvious to you looking as an outsider in the situation that, you know, the person wasn't a threat. But yet they still get shot and killed as if they were. And, and, it, and it's obvious, you know, the police officer had to have known. What do you think is going on in those cases? Is, is it just, I mean, that they, they want to kill somebody? Of, is it orders? I mean, I'm, I'm just wondering how this happens so often. Okay, it's kind of a, uh, this is uh, one way of looking at it. There's a, there's a couple of different ways of looking at it, but I'm going to give you one that comes to mind. It's kind of, it's kind of like a formula. Um, you know, if you're well-trained, you know that if a person does this, you're allowed to do this. If you're, if they do X, you're allowed to do Y. Okay. So when, like, I'm not, for one example of that is I was out on a domestic case. There was supervisors out there, lieutenants, there was fire department because it was a domestic and the guy had left the scene and we ended up catching him a couple blocks away and he was sitting down on like a, um, like a little stoop out front of a store. We had him handcuffed and he was uh, argumentative, but he wasn't violent. But I knew in my, in, you know, programmed into my programming at the time, I knew that if he did this, I could do that. And at one point he stood up and in front of like lieutenants and supervisors there in fire department, he stood up and I just kicked him right in the stomach so hard that it knocked the wind out of him and he fell back. And then uh, he got taken away by the medics to the hospital. But for me, it was like programmed into me that I need to control this subject. I know that if he does anything violent or does anything that's not, um, if he doesn't follow our orders, our lawful orders, uh, then I could do this. But it wasn't even a conscious thought. It was like a level of programming. Yeah, it's a level of programming. And so as soon as he stood up, I didn't even think twice about it. I just kicked him in the stomach, knocked him down. and um that was totally cool like it didn't even phase me that supervisors were there um i've messed people up on scene with supervisors and they like patted me on the back when i was done they're like good job and in hindsight looking at those situations completely unnecessary right so you have unnecessary violence being perpetrated against the american public and supervisors are okay with it because it's uh the formula says you can do it right there's a thing called the use of force matrix everyone should like take a minute and google this the use of force matrix is a basically a, it's a chart that shows the level of resistance by a subject and what the officer's uh, force level is that he's allowed to use. And it goes from like verbal resistance to 
um, active resistance to active physical resistance to aggressive physical resistance. And that's the entire spectrum from being you know, compliant to pulling a gun on you. And it, it covers everything in between. And there are clear and distinct separations between these various levels, right? So if someone's trying to pull away from me and they run, that's what's called active resistance. Um, and active resistance has certain things you're allowed to do. You can you know, use uh, light physical strikes, and I emphasize light. You can use uh, takedown techniques. You can do arm bars. You can you do pressure points, things like that. When, uh, because they're not actively fighting you. They're just resisting your orders and trying to get away, right? So, but if you get up to like, um, the next level up would be, um, but let's go to aggressive physical. Aggressive physical is you're in a physical fight with somebody, right? Aggressive physical is they're throwing punches. They're physically fighting you. They might not be trying to kill you, but they're actively fighting you. Um, you're allowed to go one step above what they're doing, right? So if they're going hands-on with you and they're physically fighting you, you can go to tasers, you can go to batons, you can go to all that stuff. However, at active physical, like someone's running away or someone's not complying, uh, but they're not actively physically trying to fight you, I see in these news clips all the time, cops are going to secondary weapons, cops are you know, using techniques they're not allowed to use as per the, uh, the use of force matrix. And every cop is trained in the use of force matrix. And then they just ignore it when they see fit. And supervisors are okay with them ignoring it when they see fit. A lot of these things that cops do, supervisors did before, and so it's part of the culture. Violation of the use of force matrix, part of the culture. You know, um, Lying to people to get confessions, twisting facts, uh, that is all stuff that you're allowed to do to the public, but it spills over into the professional world. Um, and so, and then, and then you have like uh, judges and you have um, attorneys, like state attorneys or district attorneys, who seemingly are okay with all this stuff too, because they're the ones who should be calling it out. And one thing I definitely want to emphasize that nobody ever talks about and nobody ever points out is that um, when, if I want to arrest somebody, nobody's going to question that arrest ever. Um, I can arrest you because you pissed me off and make something up like a disorderly conduct. Uh, disorderly conduct and resisting are the two good ones for busting somebody for nothing because you can articulate whatever you want. It doesn't have to be a victim. There doesn't have to be a witness. Um, those two charges are the charges that people who do nothing that get arrested end up getting arrested for. So... Um, when they get to the state attorney, the state attorney knows when these cases hit their desk because they have to review every arrest, right? So if someone just pisses me off, I could arrest them and I knew it wasn't going to go to trial and I knew the state attorney would kick it back um, and not file charges because there was nothing to it, but it would satisfy the need to fulfill that egotistical um, dominance, um, you know, and it would get you a, a stat uh, on your quota sheet, right? So um, cops make a lot of bad arrests just because their ego gets bruised. And there's no mechanism in place at any level to, to, to rein that in. Um, so what should happen is you make a bad arrest and it goes to the state attorney. The state attorney reviews the facts and circumstances. And if you violated someone's rights and lied about it in an affidavit, then they should send that back to your supervisors to, or they should put a charge on you themselves. Every single cop on the road, period, makes bad arrests. 100%. Because there's nobody out there on the road who's going to let their ego get stepped on. Because by the time you're on the road for long enough and people are not obeying your orders, you're walking around like, I'm, the, I'm, I'm king shit. Everyone should listen to me. And when you don't, you take them to jail. Um, and if that stuff happens when you're not at work, yeah, that's how you end up beating your wife or cheating on your wife, right? So one part that ties into this from the hypervigilance uh, emotional roller coaster that you go through with the hypervigilance stuff is that over time you end up, I mentioned like you end up, you know, kind of letting your old friends kind of slip away. Um, and you kind of focus on relationships with other cops, be it, you know, friends or real or you know, girlfriend type relationships, because you feel like they understand you, you know, you feel like you're, you know, you feel like cops get you and nobody else does. Right. Right. And so that is, that is very, that's prevalent. It's hundred percent and hundred percent of all cops experience this that um, over time their circles become smaller and smaller. And even within, and then when you get to like the police department level, um, the, um, 
the impact of that becomes uh, greater and greater because cops, like I said, they throw each other under the bus all the time. Cops are constantly getting in trouble. At my second agency, the big agency, at any given time, they had like two or 300 uh, internal affairs investigations going on for 2,000 cops. What is that, like uh, 12%, something like that? It's huge, right? It's a big number. So um, eventually, you start to look at other people within your department as you look at people on the street, right? Like everyone's an asshole except for my buddy and that, and that buddy and this one supervisor, right? That's kind of the mindset you get. And so police work becomes very cliquish because you start to think that uh, other cops are assholes too because there's a ton of road politics, a ton of road politics, all ego-driven road politics, stuff like if I'm on a call, um and uh oh here's a better one if i'm if i if i'm uh if i just took two or three calls in a row and i got two or three reports to write but the guy who works in my zone he hasn't taken a report yet or he only took one um if a call goes out sometimes what cops will do is they'll like is they'll see a call holding on the on the screen and so they'll go pull a traffic stop right so then the call will get dispatched to somebody else right that's called biffing and so you have, uh, you look at these other cops and you're like, man, that guy biffed me on a call. He's an asshole, right? And so there's a whole bunch of these little things that cops can do to each other or perceive that they do to each other. But over time, you know, you've got a cop on 15 years who's a total fucking asshole. And that's why, because he's been isolated from his friends, isolated from his family, isolated from everyone within the department, except for one or two close friends. And then now he's just a dick. And that was a byproduct of going through the entire starting with the self-indoctrination all the way through to the very end after having experienced all the, the, the negative effects of police work. Um, that's why you get these cops who have been on 15, 20 years and they're just assholes and, and everyone hates them, right? Uh, so it, it's a, all these different factors, everything that we're talking about all really ties back in to the uh, negative effects that police work has on the individual. And when it comes to protection of the self, that is like one of the hierarchical needs of, of being a human being, right? Uh, the hierarchy of needs is everything. And when you're a cop, you know, it gets to a point where you feel like your hierarchy is not being met. And it's really, uh, it, this is where it gets hard for me to put into words some of the emotions that I felt as a police officer um, because they're ultimately uh, negative and there's no solution. There isn't. Even in that book, Emotional Survival for Law Enforcement, I. Uh, I got to the section where it was like, you know, you read this whole book, you know, and 90% of the book is all these negative effects that just blew me away. I mean, when I read it, by the time I got to the third or fourth page, I was in tears because it felt like someone was spying on me and wrote the book about me. I fell into every single pitfall there is to fall into. And when I got to the section on how to be a cop and overcome these things and have a productive career, I laughed. I'm like, you're kidding me. I'm out of here. I was like, fuck you guys. I am out of here. This is, uh, nobody should go through this. You know, I wish I'd read the book before I started because I never would have started. Um, but um, uh, towards the end of a career, like you get guys who are complacent and guys who don't want to do the job and they're just, they got a year or two left to get their pension so they don't do anything. And when you're a young cop, you hate those guys. Like, God damn it. I'm on a call with this guy. He doesn't do shit. You know, but now I, I really respect those guys. I really understand everything they've been through and I know why they are the way they are. Um, but the point of the story is being a cop is, is very personally destructive. It's emotionally destructive. I left in um, early 2014. So we're looking at like six years almost exactly. And I can tell you with certainty that I still am dealing with the negative emotional repercussions of having been a police officer and um i'll get flashes of things that i did to people uh lives that i had a major negative impact on and it becomes really really difficult to uh to live with those to live with the the, the realizations that you uh were not a good guy you know you were one of the bad guys and um that it's definitely something i'm still dealing with uh for sure um, it takes many, many years. And this is nothing. Like many cops won't even realize it. They'll go through a whole career and they'll retire and they'll be miserable people whose wife left them. Their kids don't talk to them. They're divorced. And they'll never understand why it happened to them. Why is their life like that? I'm just, I feel glad that I, and, and fortunate that I came to understand all of these things, um, you know, 
fairly uh, early enough to where I could launch another career, you know, and, um, but most cops never do. Most cops never come to these realizations. I know cops who will, will not read this book on purpose. They're like, I'm not going to read that piece of garbage. I'm happy doing what I'm doing. And uh, so that's pretty much police work in a nutshell uh, as far as the um, negative destructive aspects uh, go. Well, I want to go back for a second to um, what did you call it? Was it the use of some kind of a matrix? The use, uh, of, the use, of, for, the use of force matrix. Use of force matrix. Okay. So at what point is it okay to shoot an unarmed person? An unarmed person? Okay, so when you get into shooting unarmed people, there are circumstances in which you can. So um, if you get into what's called a position of disadvantage, meaning um, let's say you're on your back and he's on top of you, mounted you, and he's hitting you. That is one situation where you're uh, allowed to shoot. You have another thing called um, officer subject factors. And this is another thing I see constantly that is, are, that's ignored all the time. Um, officer subject factors. So if you are, um, if you're like a, a woman and you're four foot 11 and you weigh 95 pounds and you go up against an unarmed subject who is 6'3", 250, obviously very strong, could physically overpower you, you are greenlit to shoot him way sooner than another man would be who is similar in height, weight, and stature, right? So you have factors, uh, like if you're going up against a guy who you know is like a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, and uh, you are greenlit to shoot that guy way sooner than if he's not or if you don't have that knowledge. But there are individual factors which would allow you to shoot somebody who's unarmed. If you're shooting, if you're shooting someone unarmed, Another situation would be like if you tell them, hey, um, don't put your hands in your pockets or don't uh, reach for anything. Um, and then they reach for something, even though it might not be a good shoot in reality, legally it's a good shoot, right? So if you have a traffic stop and someone's in the car and they're reaching in the glove box and you've repeatedly told them don't reach in the glove box and they're doing it anyway, you would be greenlit to shoot that person um, even if they're just getting like, you know, something right. out of the glove box. Cause you've repeatedly told them, they know it, they've acknowledged that you've told them, but they do it anyway. Um, that would be a situation. Um, but the problem we have with police work now is that they always jump immediately to this. I feared for my life bullshit. Now let me talk about fear in the, in the role of a police officer and then, and, and, and lies. I'll talk about fear and lies in one thing. So when you shoot somebody, you have to have a reasonable and articulable, articulatable um, fear. You have to be able to explain it. You have to be able to demonstrate uh, that there, you are actively in fear for your life. Uh, and there's no other real time that you're allowed to shoot. Um, and police, um, good agencies at least, when, they, when there's a use of force, you have to fill out a specific use of force documentation and explain the force that you used. Um, and I can tell you with certainty, 100% of the cops who fill these out lie because there is a line on every single one of these forms that said, you know, it's like a checkbox or a, a fill in the blank. And it said, I had a reasonable fear that blank or whatever. You, you understand what I'm saying. Um, and all cops have to fill that out when they do a, a use of force. Um, I can tell you a certainty, uh, in my entire career, I was only afraid twice, like real genuine fear twice. The rest of the time, you don't feel fear. You have, um, this state, you're in this state of, I'm a cop. And if you've been doing it a while, you've like, I can solve any problem. I can fix anything myself. I'm a tough guy. And it's not fear that you feel. You might feel an adrenaline rush. You might be able to apply uh, the use of force matrix and say, well, he's doing this, so I know I can do this. And that's a huge part of it. But fear itself is something I almost never felt. And when I look back at the incidents that I did feel fear, where it hit me like, oh my God, I'm, I'm scared. Um, they were completely irrational. And, and um, they were not situations where anybody could have gotten shot. So all cops lie when they fill out police reports. Uh, oh, I'm going to get to another thing here in a second. But um, when you fill out a use of force and you say, I was in fear for my life or in fear for the safety of others, that is not real fear. That is just, um, that is like um, 
just something you have to put on the paperwork because that emotion is not, and you, you don't feel that emotion anymore. Maybe if someone's shooting at you, but even in that situation, it's not something like, oh my God, I'm afraid I'm going to get shot. No, it's, oh, I need to get cut. I need to take cover. And how can I eliminate this threat? The idea that you're scared really almost never uh, entered my mind. And I've been in some situations that were pretty hairy um, that uh, you should, a normal person would be in fear. But as an officer on the road, it doesn't even register in the mind as, uh, as an emotion that you're feeling. It goes to like an adrenaline dump. And um, so, yeah, so cops lie and cops use too much force. And then uh, the combination of the two is what lets cops get away with everything. But I want to talk about a concept that I kind of coined myself, kind of came up with myself. I've never seen anybody else reference this. And that's what I call creative articulation. So I got really good at writing police reports. I could articulate anything, um, anything at all. I could go up to a guy sitting on a bench on a, in, a, in a park, on a, you know, in a public park, and kick his ass, and I could articulate how to do that, right? So they use a lot of words that don't really mean anything. You know, they make statements like, he made furtive movements. Um, I found his behavior suspicious. Like, and they're never asked to elaborate on these uh, phrases or words that they use, you know? Um, and it's that, that's how they get away with murdering people. Because what you should have in a police report is, you know, I, I entered the door, at which time I saw uh, a suspect sitting on the couch. Um, I gave him repeated commands to stand up, at which time I observed him pick up a handgun um, and I shot him three times as I felt that the situation was going to grow out of control or that people would be hurt, blah, 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 blah. But instead, you get situations where people will write something like, you know, um, I entered the apartment, I observed the subject on the couch, I gave him verbal commands, um, at which time he made furtive movements, and I shot him three times um, as I was in fear for my safety, right? So there's a big difference. One's descriptive, one isn't. And their cops are never pressed on these issues. And um, I see it on the news all the time. When you see police chiefs come out and they try to defend cops who are indefensible, that is when they're, they're using creative articulation on TV live, you know, for the public to see. You know, um, when you have very broad generic statements like uh, the suspect acted suspicious, you know, that doesn't mean anything. What does it mean to act suspicious? You should explain it, right? But they're not asked to. And those statements are seemingly good enough for everybody except uh, good defense attorneys. Good defense attorneys could dissect um, a police report and know what's what. Like, I, I love doing police report analysis. Um, anybody, has, anybody out there has a police report that they, they have, they've been in trouble or anything like that? Um, send it to me. I will do a breakdown of your police report um, because so many times people get jammed up and they don't know what to look for in a police report. They don't know. I know what I know what tricks cops use that uh, to explain things without explaining them. Right. And uh, a good lawyer will catch them. A lot of lawyers don't catch them. But really, you had to have been kind of a, a cop to uh, acknowledge that these things exist, recognize them and to expose them. But um. Yeah, so this is how cops murder people. They write up these reports that, you know, they use statements that are so broad that they don't mean anything, uh, and they can encompass so many different things that, you know, everyone just signs off on it. Like, supervisors, they don't, they, they'll always sign off on things. Like, and no matter what use of force you do, they will sign off on, right? I had, I've had sergeants help me articulate reports because I didn't know what to say, you know? So uh, when it comes to that, that to me is corruption. This is corruption on the, on, the, on the street level that most cops don't see as corruption, right? This is how we started the show, talking about corruption. Every, almost everything a cop does throughout the day is corrupt because the system is corrupt, right? Um, there are no good cops. None. Not a single one. Because it's like saying, oh, there were some good Nazis. You know, I'm sure there really were. But when the system itself is broken, it is impossible to be a good person in a broken system. It's just not possible. So when people say, you know, there's good cops out there, I, I laugh, you know, because they really believe that. But the reality is we live in a country with a system 
um, where they there are still debtors prisons. You know, you don't pay your bills. The the the, the uh, corporation um, can have you thrown in jail uh, through the legal system. You know, it happens every day. That is corruption. Uh, well, we're um, we're abiding by the laws of of a of basically a corporation, which is not even really lawful laws to begin with and they are enforcing something that is corrupt at the highest levels just correct like all right and let's use the drug war for example so um we all think oh well the, the drug war well drugs are bad right we need to protect our kids and um well not really no the drug war is the biggest scam the world has ever seen uh the drug war um and the devaluation of the dollar started in the same year uh, 1971, we launched DEA and we took um, the dollar off the gold standard. That wasn't coincidence. So um, if people don't realize this by now, uh, the CIA controls the global drug trade. Uh, they've been busted dozens of times over the years with planes full of cocaine. Everyone's heard about Air America, where they were stuffing the dead bodies of GIs in Vietnam um, with pounds of heroin to ship back into the US. That was run by Ted Shackley and his buddies at the CIA. Bunch of them connected to Watergate. We can talk about Watergate one night, one night on these shows too. Um, but um, basically, the United States government controls the global drug trade. They import the drugs, and then they send the cops out to arrest you for them. That is the biggest freaking scam of all time. I'm disgusted that I ever had any part in it, and most people don't even realize this. And no cop will admit this ever. No cop will admit that the government's been one bringing in the drugs and then sending them out to bust the drugs. It is. Uh, a financial racket on uh, 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 that makes like you know what Bernie Madoff did look like you know nothing. So um, that, I'm sorry, this is bringing me into like a, you know hate the government stuff, which we could talk about on another show, and that's not what I want to talk about tonight. But no, yeah, that's... yeah the, whole, the whole system is so corrupt, so broken that the average street cop he thinks he's a good guy, he thinks he's doing the right thing, and he's not. He's a monster. And an ignorant monster because if you're still wearing a fucking uniform, you're ignorant. If you're still, it's wearing also a, a form of mind control, and and you do you must get brainwashed uh, along the way um, because you know you start out thinking that you are the enforcer of these laws, right? Put you in a sense uh, above the law in your own mind, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And also, it's weird. You form a weird personal connection with the law that you should really never have never form. Um, I'm, I'll, I'll give you one example. Like they had just passed the law in, uh, I was down in Florida and, um, they passed the law that like, if you did a wheelie on a motorcycle, it was like, first offense was like $1,500 fine. Second offense was a felony. Right. So I remember I was sitting at a light and I saw a guy do a wheelie, probably wasn't even on purpose, Probably just had a powerful bike, couldn't handle it. Front wheel came off the ground and I tried to go after him to, to jam him up and give him a ticket because I felt like he was, I took the offense personally. Right. And so after a while, you kind of take the offenses that people do personally when you shouldn't. It's really weird. I, that one I really can't even explain. I, it has something to do with um, pride in your work or, or pride in yourself, not letting people take advantage of you. You know, things that people in general should, should, should exhibit. But when a police officer exhibits them, it's usually over the law. And uh, it doesn't phase him. It doesn't really affect his life one way or another. If someone goes to jail or not, it has no impact on their life, but they make it have an impact. They, they do make, take it personally, and they'll never admit they're wrong about something. Man, I have. So uh, once you have someone in handcuffs and uh, they're going to go to jail, for a cop to admit that they were wrong, take the handcuffs off and let them go is such a hard thing to do uh, that it's easier to I find something else to I think I've ever seen or heard of that. Yeah, I've, I've, come, I've done it a couple times myself. I've seen it happen. Um, but you, it's easier for you to live with yourself. If you jam them up on a different charge, you make something up, hit them with a disorderly resisting, whatever, um, you sleep better at night knowing that you didn't let someone get one over on you or that you didn't make a mistake. Right. Uh, another, I'll give you another example. So I went to a domestic one time, uh, the downstairs neighbor and apartment complex called in that there was a violent domestic going on upstairs. Things were breaking. And so me and uh, a couple officers go out there. We knock on the door and the TV is loud. They didn't hear us right away. Then they answered the door and uh, they're like, yeah, it was our TV. It wasn't us. It was just a couple sitting on a couch. And somewhere in my mind, I knew that it was just the TV. But 
I did not let that part of my mind uh, take control of those actions. Instead, what we did was uh, we forced ourselves in, um, we handcuffed everybody, did a search of the place, and I think we ended up arresting somebody uh, for resisting, right? So that's a situation where part of my brain knew that there was nothing going on, but the ego part of my brain who, you know, he was like, dude, he was like, no, there's nobody, there's nothing going on. He's like, fuck off. You know, the ego part of, uh, of me at the time wouldn't let that slide. So I, so we ended up just basically wrecking these people's night. Um, they wanted a supervisor out there. A supervisor yelled at me because uh, the one who didn't get arrested, you know, was going to complain. And he's like, my, su my supervisor, my sergeant straight up said to me, he's like, if you're going to get a complaint, just arrest them. And like, huh. it didn't hit me how horrible that was wow. until later. You know, I had so many incidents in my career that were just, you know, how it was and everything was cool that in hindsight were absolutely disgusting, disgusting behaviors for anyone to, to, to exhibit and demonstrate. You take people to jail to cover your own ass. Um, see, there's a dehumanization process that goes on with police. You cannot jam up a, a mother of a single mom of three kids, uh, you know, um, with thousand uh, dollars in tickets for not registering her car, uh, driving on the road with an unregistered car, you can't do that if you see the person as human. You cannot shoot somebody you see as human. You cannot um, just slam someone on the ground and break their ocular bone in their face uh, if you see them as human. So over time, you don't see them as human anymore. You just see them as numbers, right? You don't see them as people. So besides all the stuff we've already talked about, you have this dehumanization of the public. And that is, that is the biggest problem that we see today. Because cops can look at facts, they can look at what they, part of their brain is telling them, hey, there's nothing going on here. But the ego part of the brain, the good little soldier in them will not listen to that part of the brain, right? And so they will do things that one day, I hope they come to regret like me. Um, so much of my career was unnecessary. Uh, so much of the things that I did in my career were horrific. Um, I, and trust me, I've paid the price. The last six years have been hard, really fucking hard. Um, and uh, it, it's better than it was in the beginning. The first, uh, the first couple of years were really bad. I think, it's, I think after I left and actually turned in all my gear, Honestly, I think I don't, I don't think I left my bedroom for like, I think I was fucked up on drugs in my bedroom for like three months. Um, it was bad. It was, it was really fucking rough. I was seeing a shrink and that whole situation was, went to hell. Um, but it's, it's emotionally devastating. Um, once you realize it, it's very, very, it's really emotionally devastating. And I think a lot of cops, a lot of the ones, especially who, who leave, um, I think they avoid uh, embracing that that emotional trauma that they're that they experience and will experience um i've seen cops get in trouble and leave um and uh really get in trouble for nothing uh and then never end up really getting their shit together again you know never really getting a, you know back into a professional career um uh, you know diving into alcoholism or drug use or whatever and i like drug use personally i like drugs before i became a cop right you know, that's another thing, right? Well, we, I don't think I don't know if we want to talk about this, but you, you become a different person. And you have to compromise on who you were before. You know, you you really do make some compromises. Like I bust people with weed, take them to jail because I was a good little cop. I love weed, love it, always have, always will. <laughs> and uh, you know, it was just one of those things that now I look back on and um, I really regret a lot. I regret my whole career. The only good thing about it is. Um, my understanding of, of, of people in general is uh, second to none. Like, um, you know how in, um, remember in the Matrix when they're looking at the screen, he's like, oh, I just, I don't even see the code. I just see redhead, brunette, blonde, you know? Right. Nowadays, like, I don't even see people anymore. When I talk to people, I just see the code. Oh, I can tell you in five minutes your life story. You know, like, oh, this guy got molested as a kid. Oh, this one, you know, has this trauma. I mean, people demonstrate uh, their, um, their, their entire psychology, they wear on their face all the time. And I've really learned to read that over the years. So it's gotten really, I've gotten some really, I've really gotten skilled at, um, you know, dealing with people professionally 
because I understand the human psychology behind it. So that's the one thing I took away from it that I really is, is you can't learn in a book. Um, but everything other than that is um, still to this day traumatizing for me. You know, I mean, I became a workaholic. Uh, I put in every single day, 12 hour days plus. I pass out in my bed with my laptop next to me um, in the middle of something um, because work really I found was the best drug to help me um, suppress having to deal with a lot of these emotions, you know, because uh, it still is rough. It really still is. And um, well, another thing is it has to be, I mean, I can't imagine, um, you know, going to work every day with the thought in the back of my mind, uh, you know, I might be killed. I might have to kill someone, you know, and those thoughts don't enter in your mind. They don't. Um, I mean, that doesn't enter your mind any more than if you worked at a restaurant, you know, and had to do certain things. Like, yes, you have to, be, you know, push, push that out of your mind if you're going to be doing it every day. But, you know, it, it makes me think if you're not a complete psychopath, you know, actually killing people and, and uh, you know, having done it more than once and knowing that you might have to do it again, that, you know, to me has to add an, another level of extreme stress on top of everything. Well, the, here's here, the only way that cops survive and this becomes something that you, you learn over time and the guys who don't naturally adapt this end up leaving is that you compartmentalize everything. You're, you take all these little, everything that you see, everything you do, everything, uh, every part of the job you compartmentalize and you put it in a little box and you put it on a little shelf in your, in your, in your brain and uh, it sits there and it doesn't have an immediate effect on you, right? So you can go an entire career and you can see dead kids every day. You can talk, you deal with rape victims all the time, see the worst of the worst. And on a day-to-day -day basis, it doesn't phase you. It doesn't bother you. It's just another day at the office. Um, it really wasn't until after I left that my collection of boxes in my mind just started to crumble and fall apart. And um, still, like I come across like... Uh, you know, speaking euphemistically, I come across these boxes in my mind from time to time and they'll just spill open and I'll just break down crying for no reason, seemingly no reason. Uh, it's like you take that powerful emotion and, and you stash it away. And when it comes out, it like reabsorbs into you and uh, then you're forced to deal with it at that time. Right. But I'm still really good with compartmentalization. I mean, I've had some major traumas happen since I left police work. Both my parents died within six months. Um, I had all, I had all kinds of stuff. My best friend died of a heroin overdose. Um, I have had some pretty severe traumas since leaving, and uh, they haven't really phased me yet. I figure I put them in a box and I'll deal with them one day. But um, that that's another thing is that the it, having to deal with all these traumas and letting it not affect your job is key, right? I mean, if you uh, if you didn't do that, you wouldn't be able to be a cop. Uh, so that is that plays a part in the dehumanization, not of other people, but in your own dehumanization, right? My girlfriend used to call me a robot. You know, she's like, I would go in the house and I would try to talk to her. She's like, I'm not talking to you till you get out of your uniform. I'm like, okay. Like she literally would not deal with me until I took the uniform off. And I can tell you, there is a moment when you pop that bulletproof vest that you've been wearing for 12 hours. That is like, a split second you pop it and that pressure on your chest comes off, you become a different person, right? So imagine this, going back to the hypervigilance emotional roller coaster. So you're at the top, right? Like, and I compare it to like, say it's like a, an amphetamine, it's like speed, right? I call it cop meth. So you go to work and you're, you're on this you know, high all day long. And then when you get out of the job and you get home and you pop that vest off and you take your uniform off, that is the moment that you crash and you do crash, you crash hard, really freaking hard. And pretty much you're not functional again until you go back to work the next day. Good luck doing, having any hobbies, good luck having any things you do on the side or, you know, um, basically you are worthless when you take that uniform off, uh, physically because you're drained. Your body just went through a ton of stress that your mind hasn't comprehended that you went through, right? So. Um, the process of every day going to work and coming home and going through the swings, anyone out there who's ever been addicted to any drugs should know exactly what I'm talking about. Because over time, it does become an addiction that 
and you demo, and like I said before, cops don't realize they're even going through this. So, but um, I know I got a little bit off topic there, but uh, it, it, that's such an important point to emphasize is that cops really are not even human anymore on that level, on that level of empathy. Empathy isn't a word that uh, cops know at all. Someone could be pleading with you, please, man, it's just a ticket. Don't take me to jail. You know, I'll pay it. I know I've been caught before, whatever. Um, and that person who feels empathy would, would take their circumstance into account and be like, look, man, I get it. I'm, I understand where you're coming from. Just, uh, you know, don't do it again or something like that. Right. When you're a cop, you don't feel that. You don't recognize that. It's compartmentalized in your mind. And so someone could be begging with you, pleading, please, it's going to ruin my whole life. And it doesn't even phase you one bit. You're like, sorry, man, because uh, everyone's got a story. You know, on average, I would be sent out on you know somewhere between ten and twenty calls a day, depending. Um, a very slow day was under ten. An average day was probably twelve, thirteen, something in that area. Busy day, you're hitting twenty calls a day. Everyone's got a story, right? So you don't really see it any longer as a person telling you their problem that needs to be solved. You just see it as another another asshole who's lying to you, right? That's how it is. Because like you do learn that like everyone lies to you. Everyone, victims, witnesses, suspects. There's not a person you, your bosses, you know? There's not a person you interact with in a day who isn't lying right to your face. And so, you know, that really gets, you get to really recognize lies quick, real quick. Every lie has a corresponding behavior. And so nowadays when people try bullshitting me and they don't have whatever the corresponding behavior to that lie is, it's like, dude, shut up. <laughs> well, detecting lies these days has become so easy. The, people don't realize that they, I should write a book about lies. The really, it's, it's a science. There's, uh, so, there's so many innate things that we do when we lie to people that um, they become brutally obvious when people are lying. Uh, oh, if anyone, I, I, there's a book out I, I recommend to everyone, everyone pick up. It's, um, God, what's it called? It's um, Never Be Lied To Again. That is a great book. It's called Never Be Lied To Again. Um, it goes over the very basics of lies. And uh, they could definitely be expounded upon. But yeah, everyone should pick up that book. Uh, it teaches you about the, the, the human nature and how lying violates human nature as far as the physical reactions go. I know I definitely got way off topic with that. but um, No, no worries. Um, now, how often do you think um, police officers taking bribes is going on? Um, and also um, drug trafficking, like within the department. Hmm. Uh, what was the first part of that question again? Sorry. Uh, bribes. So, you know, officers okay, bribes. taking bribes. Personally, I've never seen it. Um, and the thing about, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Um, the, here's the thing about bribes. Uh, I think that you'll find that p if people get involved with police work uh, and they go through that self-indoctrination, um, if someone would have offered me a bribe while I was a cop, it, could, it didn't matter how much it was. You could offer me a million dollars. I wouldn't have taken it because in my mind, I was a good cop and the only thing that mattered was, was doing the job. And most of the cops I knew were the same way. Like you couldn't bribe almost anybody that I knew at the time because it didn't fit the um, basic functions of being a good cop, right? You want approval, really. What it comes down to the, 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 the psychological need for approval, right? So you want approval from your bosses and somewhere in your mind, um, you know, you're not even, you wouldn't even consider it. I would never consider it. So when I see these, um, when I see people on the news who, you know, cop caught, you know, being bribed, um, what I think of is either he got into police work for the wrong reasons, never gave a shit about really what police were supposed to do. He got in it for the, for the, for the naturally corrupt nature of it and um or he is a cop who's been around a while a very long time he's got uh you know two ex-wives and child support and he feels underappreciated the job like the job owes him something um those people i could see taking bribes right but you got the 99 percent who are in the middle range who would never really enter into their mind 
to, to, to take a bribe, no matter how much it is, um, because it just doesn't fit who they are at that moment, right? You see what I'm saying? So when you see guys who do take bribes, they were corrupt from the start. They, they had to have been corrupt from the start or in so much debt that they just don't know how else to get out of it. Um, and the drug dealing part, this is the part that really blows me away. Um, we all know the CIA controls the drugs, right? But they don't really have people at police. They probably they got people at the big police departments. But I, you know, the departments I worked for weren't major. They weren't New York PD. It wasn't LAPD. Nothing big like that. So I, I never saw it personally. Um, but in the last couple of years, there have been at least six or seven departments where either the whole department was in on it or a, a whole unit was in on it. Like in Baltimore. Google the Baltimore corruption scandal that went on where they had the drug unit that was framing people, kicking in drug dealers' doors, taking their money, taking guns. None of it ever ending up in a police report, you know, but um, the idea of personal gain wasn't really anything that ever entered into my mind when I was a cop, right? I mean, now I work for myself. I want to make a million freaking dollars, right? But that wasn't the mindset I was in then. I just wanted to, you know, feel satisfied with myself in that I did a good job, right? So like when you're being a cop is like being a dog, you know, it's that simple. You want approval and you do what you got to do to get that approval. And when you vary outside those lines, you start to get into some really deep psychology of the person or really uh, some, some shady circumstances. Um, but uh, there were some weird guys who, who got arrested from the, the departments I worked at um, before I got to my first department, they had just had a child pornography scandal. One of the cops got arrested for child porn, like probably three months before I got hired. So they were, that was the active talk when I got there. Um, there was another guy at the second department I worked for who was, um, basically busted with prostitutes, which really isn't a big deal. Everybody should, you know, it's not, everyone should use prostitutes. You know, that's probably not the case, but the reality is it shouldn't be a crime. So consenting deal between two people can be regulated just like marijuana is being regulated, you know? Um, so I don't really see it as a negative thing, but there was a guy who was definitely a freak. I mean, he was uh, busted at numerous sex parties and busted with prostitutes. I mean, he got busted like three or four times where it got back to the department, he got arrested for stuff. And, um, you know, so there's things like that go on, but like really 90% of all cops are exactly the same. I could tell them their life story because the psychological things that prompted them to become a cop, you know, are, are the same that I went through. And the behaviors and the psychological aspect of themselves as a cop are the things I went through. So I could pretty much tell you a life story of anybody who's a cop now, except for, you know, this, there's outliers, of course, but it's always the same story, you know. And it always comes back to feeling the need to be part of a group, being part of something greater than yourself. This is a human need. Everyone needs to be part, feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. I think it's a human function of evolution. But um, that is really why people cling to the career. You know, they can be, I've seen cops who are like, the job just wasn't for them. Not that they weren't good cops, but I could see the effect it was having on their lives, right? But the need to stay as in part of that club, or that little click of being a cop, feeling like you're, um, special and respected and above the law, that becomes so crucial. I mean, like when we would see guys who would quit or guys who got in trouble and left, you know, God, we would, we would talk about them like they were lepers. Like, oh my God, he's not a cop anymore. What, oh my God, like, what's he doing? I mean, you talk about people who left the profession as, they, as though they were outcasts, really. And like, you know how many cops I still talk to from my career? I think I got, I think I got three on my Facebook, two of them I never talked to, one of them I talked to every six months. And at the time they were all close friends. You know, my, my, I had so many close friends in law enforcement, but if you're not a cop, you are not one of them. You'll never be respected by them again, even on a subconscious level, even if this is, this might even be subconscious, right? But you know, if you're not in, you're out and that's how it is. And that's why there's such a high police suicide rate because the job becomes your identity. Um, once you're in and you've gone through the training and you've been there a couple of years, you are not yourself anymore. You are, a, uh, you are a mechanism of the police department. And without that job, you no longer know how to function. 
when I left, I had to learn how to be a normal person again. I had to rebuild my entire life. I'm still working on rebuilding, you know, the emotional and psychological aspects of a normal person. Um, but that's just, um, that's, that's what leads to police suicide. And if you look it up, um, police suicide, um, this year was the highest it's ever been, which is kind of strange because police violence sh and shootings are the lowest they've ever been. Violence against police officer in 2019 is the lowest in history ever. Um, so any cop ever tells you there's a war on cops, just show them the statistics and tell them to fuck off because <laughs> there is no excuse for police in, today, soci in today's society to have to demonstrate and exhibit the levels of violence we're seeing. This is unacceptable completely unacceptable. And then when you see the statistics and you see how it is genuinely the safest time, right now is the safest time in human history. It sounds crazy, but you know, I mean, there was a time when you could murder people and it was okay with the king or whatever, you know, <laughs> police right. force we had back 300, 400 years ago. But there was a time someone pissed you off, you could murder them and it was all good. Like you didn't have to worry about it. We're not in those days anymore. We are genuinely in the safest times in human history. So I did an episode of my show, Debunking Cops, episode four. I highly recommend everyone go and watch it. I basically debunk this guy named Dave Grossman. Dave Grossman wrote a book called On Killing and on, another book called On Combat. And he is the single biggest proponent uh, for police violence that there is. He goes around the country. He's booked 250, 300 days a year. Um, and he does like a three hour, four hour seminar. And he tries to make cops feel good about the violence they demonstrate and for shooting people. And um, I'm not gonna go into all of it, it would take forever, but basically he works for the CIA or the Mossad. I haven't determined which one, but he definitely works for one of those two. Um, he's, uh, his books are completely written and based upon principles that were developed during World War II uh, by the OSS that have been completely debunked over time. Um, his book on killing, basically the thesis of it is that human beings have this innate resistance to kill other people, right? Now on the surface, that sounds like it could be very reasonable, but then when you go into the origins of his research and what his research was based on, you'll find that um, the original proponent of these theories was a pure OSS propagandist. His name was S.L.A. Marshall, and he's the one who kind of originated these theories of uh, in-fire combat ratios. Um, and Dave Grossman basically has made a career for the last 20, 30 years going around the country, amping cops up that nothing they do is wrong. Um, when they shoot somebody, they shouldn't feel bad about it. And his, all of his theories are based upon lies that were put forth by whom else than our intelligence agencies. So definitely go watch that episode four of Debunking Cops. It'll change the way you think of police um, and anybody who is a proponent of police work. Definitely. But, um, now, uh, in closing tonight, for the last few minutes we have, uh, there's so much changing in our world right now. Uh, you know, we're growing increasingly dystopian and the uh, censorship is, is mounting up. Um, the future is very, it's very iffy right now where, what direction we're going. Uh, where do you think the future of law enforcement is going? Do you think it's going to follow this trend of, uh, increasing, um, I guess, surveillance and just overall control? Um, or do you see it getting any better? Oh no, it's definitely getting worse. It is. I've lost all hope. Honestly, to be honestly, I, I, see, I watch, you know, uh, politics. I've, I've always kept up with politics. I, I understand politics really well. And I look at these guys on TV, you know, people clinging to Republican and Democrat titles, and they, 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 they got to, you know, stick with their, their, their little clan, you know, and, if, uh, and uh, it, it's, it's all political theater. And when it comes to the police, even though the statistics show that society is not violent, as violent as it used to be, police keep uh, ramping up. Um, their, their negative attitudes towards the public and they keep ramping up the violence. I mean, even this, I haven't gotten the statistic yet for this particular year, but in 2018, they hospitalized something like 53,000 people um, across the country. Um, that's going to continue to continue. That's going to continue to rise. Um, 
the attitudes towards the public, they're still going to cling to this. We have this, uh, you know, there's a war against cops bullshit mentality. And to be completely brutally honest with you, when you combine my understanding of like the, the police state with uh, what's going on in the world, particularly with Israel, like I have completely lost hope. Like we're fucked on a scale that unless we're willing to have an actual global physical revolution and murder about the top 10,000 people who control everything, we're doomed on a scale I can't even begin to explain. I joke with my roommate all the time because he makes political comments and I'm like, the, the, we have one solution and one solution only. And we can hope that this happens. And uh, that is a huge, giant meteor comes from outer space and just collides right into Earth and wipes all of us off this freaking planet. That is probably the single best thing that could happen to the earth because we are a corrupt to our core species. I think all the good that's, that we've ever done over the years is ultimately tarnished by our ultimately corrupt nature. And I just don't have any faith in humanity to do the right thing. We're all brainwashed by the CIA and propaganda. No one believes me when I tell them half the shit about the last hundred years, that's true. You know, I tell people Adolf Hitler never had any gas chambers and they look at you like your freaking hair's on fire and they don't want to talk to you again, right? That's the kind of society that we live in. And no, so- I, I, you're right. Uh, yeah, I, I do see, you know, I see a lot of people waking up that I haven't before. That is encouraging. But what you just said, it reminds me of something that happened today. Uh, I was talking with a group of people that, you know, probably have no idea about what's going on besides uh, what they're watching in the mainstream media. And I had mentioned the doomsday clock, how it's now 100 seconds to midnight. And about five of them, grown adults all over 30, looked at me and said, what is the doomsday clock? I know, right? Seriously. Um, people they're, they're, don't want the truth. Like, I'll give you an example. Like, people don't want reality. They don't want, they don't want the truth. The truth hurts. Um, so I, I don't know if anyone's gone out and watched my um, two-part series on Kennedy. But, you know, in the past couple months, I solved the Kennedy assassination. I can name the grass and old shooter. I can name the umbrella man. And, uh, you know, I, I, I can name about a dozen people who no one's ever identified before in Daly Plaza. You know, I, can, I got all this information. Um, I've been banned from JFK forums. I was banned from their Twitter, a couple Twitters. I can't seem to get booked on any show except yours to talk about it. You know, people don't want to hear the truth. The shows are still up, by the way, everyone. Go check those out. Um, people don't want to hear the truth. They really just don't. You know, like, um, here's a good example. About three or four years ago, they solved the Jack the Ripper mystery. They identified Jack the Ripper by DNA. They, we know who he is. I know who Jack the Ripper was. It's out there. But yet, like a year ago, I saw them, somebody make a show on like broadcast television. Ooh, the mystery of Jack the Ripper. It's like, <laughs> they just don't want to know. People do not want to know anything. They want to live in a fucking fantasy world. And I have just completely lost all hope in everybody, really. Like, really, human, humanity as a species, when you look at us and forget about our technological advancements. That was just, you know, we're technologically advanced because of about a dozen people over the last, you know, what, five billion years since we were like that cosmic soup, right? So I just don't, as a whole, on average, we just do not, um, you know, we're destroying our environment. Um, we, we, we do things that are so contrary to nature itself. I, I just, I'm very disheartened. Um, my goal is to make a couple million bucks and disappear. <laughs> Pretty much what's gonna happen. I'm gonna disappear from third world country and live in a hut on the beach. Like, I just don't want any part of this global surveillance state. You know, I just don't want any part of like pop culture. You know, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm just kind of like. It, it's, it is disappointing that, that more people aren't at least, you know, taking notice of it, much less standing up and trying to do something about it or speak up about it. it you know, everyone turns a blind eye. If they do speak up, up about it, it'll just be for like a second, like, oh yeah, that sucks, but what are you gonna do, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, and like I, I've gone down in my mind. I, I mean, I've gone down every political path there is, and they all lead to dead ends. Like there are no solutions to the problems that the world is facing right now. There just aren't. Uh, all the politicians are a bunch of puppets. You know, either side, it doesn't matter. It they're all controlled under the same you know umbrella. So it doesn't matter who's going to be in that office. At least that's my thought. Yeah, I mean, look at Trump. You know, Trump was like, "Oh, we're going to get out of Syria." We're going to do this. Ah, we don't want to be at war. And what the hell does he do? He gets in office. And, uh, you know, Putin said this um, uh, in one of his uh, 
in an interview a couple years ago, he's like, uh, he was talking about, you know, they're asking him about, um, you know, pol policies in Russia and this and that, and, he, and he, they mentioned America, and he goes, in America, you get the president, they ask him about the presidential election, and he's like, uh, oh, well, it doesn't matter who's in office. He's like, nothing ever changes. He's like, what happens is the president gets elected, and he walks in and sits down in his office, and then a bunch of member briefcases come in and say, this is how it works. And that's exactly what happens. And those men with the briefcases work for the CIA. The CIA has run this country for the last, God, since Kennedy. I think the CIA is the mechanism that Israel uses to uh, control us. And they were Isn't probably running us since the onset after the OSS. Um, yeah, well, let me think. Who was, uh, who was in office in 45? Was that, um, it wasn't Eisenhower. Eisenhower was after that. But yeah, I would say since Eisenhower, yeah. um, that's absolutely correct. Um, but it, uh, it definitely is after Kennedy. I mean, we lost our sovereignty on November 22nd, 63. Uh, anybody who doesn't believe that thinks that it couldn't have been a conspiracy that large doesn't realize that all the guys who helped enact that conspiracy were working for James Angleton in the OSS. And now 20 years later, they're working for, they're controlling various uh, departments of government. You know what I mean? So. Um, the CIA controls America, and Israel controls the CIA, and that's the global power structure. And um, so we know who really needs to get knocked off first if there's going to be any hope for any kind of future. Right. Man, there's so much more we can talk about, and of course, I'm going to have you on again in the future. Corey, thanks so much. That was yeah, and next time. I'm Next time, I definitely, um, when I come on, I want to talk about particularly this, uh, the Zionist threat that we're all under um, and the nonsense that is the Holocaust. That would be great if we could do that next time. Yeah, definitely, 100%. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. That was very important information. Everybody needs to hear this, uh, and we will uh, talk to you again soon. Thanks so much. Amen. Thanks for having me on.